All right. Um, for those that um, I, I recognize a lot of familiar faces, for those um, that don't know who I am, I'm Amy Snellgrove. I'm a project facilitator with Texan by Nature, uh, and I've been working on our South Central Monarch Project. It's a project funded by NIFWF through their Monarch Bar Butterfly Conservation Fund. And Carrie, when she visited me, she said just a brief one slider. I had like 15 two weeks ago, and then last, you know, yet the other day I had to bring it down to seven, and now I'm down to one. So I'm almost out of slides. So I looked through our slide deck, and I know most of you um, know we had a symposium back May 31st, June 1st. It was a two-day symposium at Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. We pulled together folks uh, covering research and monitoring, land conservation management, communications. We pulled that whole group together, and so I just want to give you a status of where we're at with the project. The project started with that symposium. We've now moved and we gathered all that information. There's about 120 pages of uh, information that we had at the end of that symposium. We went through, we synthesized it, and we were left with what we're calling the straw man report. Straw man, by definition, is the very beginning of something. It's not the, the last word, it's the beginning. And so we're taking that straw man, we formulated a, a post symposium working group that we're going to help move our project forward through May 2018. So the straw man report, this is kind of, the, I just broke, pulled the, basically this is the table of contents I pulled into a slide. And it goes over basically a background of our project and objectives, a general understanding, uh, population monitor, monitoring. One of the things that we did also that wasn't part of the symposium, but we did post to incorporate was that we took every conservation plan that focused on Texas and Oklahoma and pulled together the objectives within those conservation plans to see if we could see overarching trends between all of them because there's a lot of them. So we have a section on that that kind of pulls in what the common goals were and objectives between all of those plans. Um, a data gap, so seed availability, working with rural landowners, working with urban suburban landowners, working with right ways and then the communications with both the conservation community, commu communicating research results to the conservation community, and then those folks taking it then to the public. It's a lot of information. So we're now um, in the point where we're going to start diving into that. We've got our working group. We were going to get a big group together for an all-day meeting, um, but it is November and December, and so that's proven to be difficult. So our goal now is to move and strategically pull partners together for uh, seed availability, those that would have been working with. We're going to kind of really tailor those meetings to help advance us forward for things that surface within that that we can do for our project moving forward. So a lot of exciting stuff within that document. I have data gaps highlighted because fortunately I've been getting to work with Carrie Dupuy a lot. Um, the, the comptroller's office has funded a lot of research and she's in the process I know we'll discuss throughout this meeting of uh, uh, things that they're doing to kind of figure out where our data gaps are in research, um, what's being done, what do we have enough information on, what we don't what we don't, what is the highest priority in ranking. And our goal for this project is hopefully by May, um, if not before then, is to get a really good feel for what's out there, what we still need to do, and what priority it is. And then hopefully um, we can start finding funding to fill some of those gaps. But that, uh, in a nutshell, I don't want to take too long because I know Ben um, is coming up, but we have uh, got all this information. He's going to talk about the Monarch Summit that day that we had last week. We're going to pull that information as well. Probably going to pull in the information gathered at this meeting. We've got a lot to weed through. And um, hopefully we'll be able to steer a path forward so that we can come up with some good support for all of the folks that are doing great work to help fulfill a need that you guys need through our project. Any questions? All right. Oh, oh sorry. Is that report going to be made available for people to look at? Yes, I, I, we call it a report. I, I, I will distribute it through whoever. Um, if, if you want to get a copy of the report, just email me at amy at texanbynature.org. And I guess I should have slide with my, my contact information on it, but um, it is available. But keep in mind, a lot of folks will say, well, can I critique it? Well, yes, absolutely critique it because we need that critique moving forward. But keep in mind, the straw man is simply the information uh, organized and laid out strategically in a report that kind of is a, a starting point, not an end point. So just to make that um, clear. Some folks say, well, I don't think that's right. Well, that's fine. 
it may not be right, but it was discussed, and then we're gonna we're gonna take that moving forward and flesh through it and see what surfaces and what doesn't. And after it was released last, we finished it last Wednesday or the October 25th, so maybe that's two Wednesdays ago now. And uh, just reading through it in full, it's really amazing at some of the really big issues that are surfacing. And the funny thing is, as we heard it last week at the summit, Ben will talk about it in a second, and then again this week at this um, meeting this week. So it, it's really interesting. I think there are some things surfacing that really need to be done. So hopefully through our project, we can help accomplish that. Guys. So our next presentation will be um, Ben Hutchins from the uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Department to talk about the Texas Monarch Summit that was held last week and the effort they're doing to lead a statewide planning effort for the Monarch. Okay, thanks everybody. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ben Hutchins. Invertebrate biologist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. I'm not going to stay up here very long. I just have a few slides to summarize this two-day effort that we had last week in in Bernie, Texas. Bastrop. I'm sorry, Bastrop. Yep. Thank you. So, so the goal the goal of this of the summit was to start thinking about how to develop a, a statewide monarch conservation plan, one that is quantitative, um, but also voluntary, right? So the idea here was to bring together a large group of constituents involved in monarch conservation in the state and think about, you know, what are we able to do, what needs to be done, and, and, and how, do we, how do we move forward? Uh, and so we were lucky enough that the Lower Colorado River Authority hosted us at McKinney Ruffs Nature at McKinney Ruffs Nature Center. Really nice facility. Uh, we had uh, 74 participants for this two-day event, representing 48 different agencies and organizations from around the state. In addition to Lower Colorado River Authority. This effort was supported by Texas Parks and Wildlife, the National Wildlife Federation, and Texan by Nature. So <clears throat> we have a, a lot of breakout sessions, a lot of good, uh, a lot of good discussion, lots of notes, and in the next kind of few weeks, we'll be synthesizing those notes, transcribing those notes. Uh, and coming out with kind of some of the takeaway messages. And so, kind of consider what, I, what I'm going to be talking about here as preliminary. This is kind of what's stuck in my head as some of the emerging themes. Uh, one was that we had, I was really happy to see a lot of support for the idea of the importance of a statewide monarch conservation plan. You know, so, so several years ago, Texas Parks and Wildlife worked with a few of our partners on a monarch and native pollinator conservation plan. Uh, this really kind of moves beyond that in that it, uh, the idea is that it's going to be, uh, that it's going to incorporate participation from a much broader base and that it's going to be more quantitative as well uh, and more detailed in terms of the actions that are required to meet uh, um, some of the goals that we identified. And so I was just happy to see that amongst the different organizations that were represented, people generally kind of agreed with one another about how to move forward. There wasn't a lot of argument. So it's kind of boring, but that's okay. Um, it wasn't boring. It, it was a lot of fun, a lot of consensus and support for that idea. Uh, as continually comes up at these meetings, there's a lot we don't know about monarch populations in Texas, uh, about the state of monarch conservation, about what are some of the limiting factors here in Texas, what are some of the threats. And so, you know, there was a lot of, of discussion about some of the additional research that was needed uh, in order to arrive at kind of quantitative goals for the state or to identify real priorities in conservation. And so, you know, I applaud uh, the work that a lot of folks in this room have been doing, and a lot of the other work that the controller has funded in terms of research, uh, you know, we're not done yet. So, the other kind of emerging theme was the need for kind of a centralized 
framework for reporting efforts. You know, so whether this is a monarch conservation database that's been discussed here, uh, some of the other databases that some of our organizations were developing, the, the, the important thing was that we need to make sure that all of the different efforts that various conservation groups are engaged in, that those get identified, they get reported, particularly when we think about U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's species status assessment and the, the, the peace process uh, that Katie talked about earlier, uh, that we need to make sure that, that we do a good job getting all of our efforts into that species status assessment and that evaluation process. Uh, there was also uh, another issue that came up again and again was a need for a centralized database of resources. So guides for landowners, guides for conservation practitioners, uh, lists of important plants for monarchs. You know, and in this meeting, in my mind, it seems that Monarch Joint Venture has been at the forefront of trying to fill that role. Uh, and so, you know, at our Texas Monarch Summit, we were really focused on Texas-specific resources. Uh, and so, you know, I think maybe there's some question about how can Monarch Joint Venture simultaneously play the role of a national level organization, but also meet kind of state specific needs. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's still a lot of questions about that, but how, whatever that looks like in the end, there needs to be kind of a one-stop shopping in terms of getting all of the information that's out there because we know there's tons of information out there, tons of guides, uh, and it's just a matter of finding all of that. Uh, and then, you know, one of the other kind of re-emerging themes was it's absolutely crucial to, to do this research, to get good data, and to use the best available science to arrive at, at some kind of measure of the state of, of habitat for the monarchs in terms of what are the resources available. But when it comes to actually setting goals for how much conservation do we want to do as a, as a consortium of conservation groups, those actions have to be voluntary. Nobody at this meeting has really the authority to tell other folks that they have to do something. So these so goals have to be largely self-identified. Uh, although again, all of that needs to be based on, on what the science is telling us needs to happen. Uh, but that the path forward, you know, the way that we meet these goals has to be, uh, it has to be consensus based. Uh, you know, particularly in a state like Texas, um, dominated by private lands uh, and an emphasis on, on um, landowner, landowner rights. This has to be a consensus-based voluntary effort, otherwise we're never going to get buy-in. So just kind of moving forward from that summit, uh, it was decided that we would form an executive <coughs> committee and that that executive committee would then start sending out kind of inv invitations and notices, requests for individuals, agencies, and organizations to form this broad consortium of partners. And so the idea is to catch a big net or to cast a big net uh, and involve as many groups as are interested to be a part of this consortium and provide feedback to provide review in the development of a state conservation plan. Uh, and so certainly that consortium is not going to be limited to the people that attended the, the summit, right? And so, you know, we have to look at who showed up and importantly, who were the big players that didn't show up that need to be in this consortium as we move forward to develop this plan if we want it to be successful. Uh, thinking about U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's timeline, our goal, and it's uh, Granted, an ambitious one is to, to try to draft a statewide <coughs> plan by June. So we have a few months of, of review to get this into the peace process by late summer, early fall, when that peace process opens up. That's the idea. And, and there was talk of, of trying to find funding to support at least a temporary position to help in drafting of that plan and development of that plan although we're not exactly sure what that funding might look like just yet. Uh, we do know that some other states have taken that route and it's been, that, that it's been a valuable approach. 
And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Are there any questions for Ben from the audience? You said that it needed a statewide database of resources. What are some examples of the kind of things you're wanting to see? Yeah, so there was a lot of, dis of discussion about that. Some examples included regionally specific plant lists um, that could be used in mainly in, in kind of smaller urban or rural gardens. Uh, uh, additional examples included kind of step-by-step, -step, regionally specific kind of standard operating procedures for specific habitat restoration practices. Uh, so, for example, step-by-step, -step, how do you how do you control uh, non-native invasives to prepare a plot for reseeding with with native plants? You know, so. Just taking that one bit, the controlling invasives, in a specific region, say the Lower Rio Grande Valley, uh, from start to finish. Thank you all for being patient with us online. And I think for the group that's in the room, we'll go ahead and get um, get back started again. Our next speaker is um, Dr. Will Goodwin from St. Houston State University, and he'll talk about his research. Thank Hello, I'm, I'm Will Godwin from Sam Houston State. Normally you hear from Dr. Jerry Cook, who is our PI, but he's not available today. And we take a little bit uh, different approach to this. Jerry is an ant taxonomist, and I am a scarab or dung beetle specialist. And uh, our other PI, Tamara Cook, is a parasitologist. So we have a, we come new to the monarch world, and hopefully we're taking a little bit novel approaches and showing some things differently, maybe. Our project is mostly focused on OE, given our capabilities with Dr. Cook. And uh, no. study of the. Do you mind staying close sure. over here? I know. There you go. I'm, I'm used to talking to a class, so I can project. <clears throat> so most of our studies are. are uh, focused on OE fitness. We have two graduate students working. And uh, I'd like to say that this time element is also very critical here. We've only really had one year of, of data collection on this thing. And uh, given that the next year is, is the final one, it's uh, critical to get things right. So most of our work so far has been done with collecting spores, demonstrating that we can actually infect larvae so that one of our students can do studies on fitness effects. And we want to collect good, robust data on the effect of, that the parasite's having on fitness. And the other is sort of an embryological study where we're going to infect larvae and cut them open and, and look at the, the histology of the actual infection. There are a few questions that are unanswered there. This line of research has been impeded by Hurricane Harvey mostly. We had a source of eggs from a farm that's been just completely destroyed. So we're counting on this next year with a new source of eggs that's supposed to come on sometime in about a month or so. So one of the things I would like to accomplish at this meeting is if anyone knows of sources of eggs that could hurry us up a little bit, that would be very, very helpful. We have quite a few other little wheels that spin off those two big wheels that can keep going. And some of this data is uh, rather anecdotal, but I think it's informative. And it's going to be informative towards, like you say, designing the questions to be tested in the future. So we've looked at monarch overwintering. We've looked at something called hay field studies. Since roadsides are being done, We've looked at, we're looking at hay fields. And we want to understand the host plant landscape. So there are like three or four points I want to make here. I'm just going to go ahead and make them off my notebook without the uh, slides so yet. Hay field studies. Roadside studies are very important. But we've found that if we go and look at hay meadows, where those things are mowed, we can get very good, deep data. I can go to this one hay meadow where this 88-year-old lady has been running that hay farm for many, many years. 
And she has a little notebook like this where she has written down every day that those meadows have been mowed. So given that we only have two years to conduct these studies, how do we go and get data into the past? How do we see into the past as it is? We can do that by sort of co-opting this data. And I've got a slide about that in a minute. Another way we'd like to see into the past, I think it might be a little unusual, we want to look at old specimens. When we found that we can go out and we've got a method where we can take these monarchs while they're alive without really hurting them, and we can take those tapes back to the lab and find a positive or negative. We can see if that individual was infected or not. Does anybody else in this, in this world have this tape type data? So here's a, a map of our infection rates. We're basically finding, all in the Houston metropolitan area, large rates. I had to make all those other data collection sites, I had to give them some fake data just so they would show up because they had no infection. So that's not those red marks. Those are 38 out of 51 individuals that are uh, infected. We're going to have another year of data on top of this to inform it. It's probably not enough to be statistically significant yet, but I think we're going to get there. Some other way that we're thinking to look into the past is with museum specimens. Quite a few of those specimens that we've looked at are old. And we're looking at old museum specimens back to the 50s to see if they were infected or not. So one of the problems with this, if you go into iDigBio or GBIF and you try to look up where are monarch specimens, they're not very many. Have you noticed that? People just don't collect them. Same reason there are not many houseflies or American cockroaches in collections. People just don't collect them. It's, it's, it was common. If you go look at the iNaturalist data, there are dots everywhere. If you go look at certain biodiversity aggregators, they will show millions of dots. But they're, I hate to use this word, we'll say they're contaminated with iNaturalist data, which is all observational. And the real hard specimens are hidden in there. We could just sort them out. Well, what we find is the oldest specimens available from Texas are 1870, collected by Jacob Bowl, who are moving forward on collecting spore data from these old specimens. We'd like to be able to show that what if these OE infections significantly drop or are not even there before the introduction and cultivation of uh, the tropical milkweed? That would be a very nice corollary set of data. Going yeah, so there's bold. Those specimens are from Dallas. They're in the MCZ right now in, in Harvard from Dallas. And if we go look, there are monarch specimens scattered all over the world in the Paris Museum. These are monarchs from Texas. So far, we can't find any back before 1870. So we're going to be testing more specimens. We want to look at the overwintering. Do you all have these old records? Here's a Psyche paper from 1893 that talks about monarchs overwintering. Have you all got this in your, in your uh, bibliographies and data? I just ran across it randomly one day. And this isn't overwintering here in Texas. This is overwintering at Harvard. <coughs> so we have some old informative data this shows overwintering. And this is a, a graphic representation of one of our sites in Houston. What you'll see is, number one, you'll see that from 12 of December last year, 
through January, February, and March, we've got the temperature graphed out. And we see that there are two big frost events in Houston. Let me say that we're collecting this data with partners in Houston who grow lots of milkweed in their garden, lots of tropical milkweed. So all of our data is collected by text messages. Oh, we have this, we have that, and we collate all these text messages from these people in their gardens. And what turned out really remarkable is we have adults flying, and we have these really bad frosts down into the 20s, and then just a few days later we start getting text messages from these gardeners. Oh, the monarchs are back. It's just two days after the freeze. I thought they were all gone. So this is rather anecdotal, but if we collect enough of it, it's going to become data. Our hay field studies, I find them very interesting. We can go to these hay meadows, like this one, and we can map out all the milkweeds that are growing there. And what we find is these meadows get mowed maybe twice a year, which is probably very close to the rate at which highway right-of-ways get mowed. So we think we could probably use these hay meadows, because hay meadows are all over Texas. And everybody keeps records like this. And what we find is very interesting. What really made this catch off was the fact that this rather unusual milkweed, Asclepius amplexicollis, doesn't ever show up in much of the studies. It's always Viridis and the common roadside ones. But how many species of milkweed are there in Texas class? About 36 or 32, depending on who you talk to. Maybe some of them come right up to the border, but haven't been quite found yet. Your man, Singhurst, has got a good handle on it. There are a lot of species of milkweeds. And I'm going to read you a comment that I wrote while I was listening to all the talks today. And you can beat me up over it later. But I wrote... Monarchs are extremely fragile. They go a long way. And they're smart. And they are selected. They lay a lot of eggs. So maybe we should be looking at these other milkweeds in a little more, a little more closely. Because when we have a hay meadow like this, and we go out there and do <coughs> our surveys, and we find 100 acres with five milkweeds that we have to work our butt off to find. But the monarch found them, and she laid an egg on it. And she ate it to the ground in November. So what we see is, I, I know most of you are concerned with the monarch migration, but coming from entomology, we know that these insects are extremely resilient. And given that there are all these milkweeds, and they're scattered out in the landscape like this, there's, there's a little hope that that uh, this system is much more resilient. And this is how we graphed out the data from some of those hay meadows. It's a little complicated, but I don't know any other way to do it. We have a hay meadow that was... Milkweeds are growing and fruiting by July 4th. The hay man comes and mows. Actually, this happened because we're out there on July 4th, and we're like, wow, we found monarchs in this hay meadow. That's amazing. And then the hay guy shows up, and he cuts it all down. I'm like, oh, God, they mowed it all down. But then we're like, oh, no, this is good. This is like a natural experiment. And we didn't have to pay the guy to mow everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's working for us. So we map out how long does it take the milkweed to grow back. By September 5th, these amplexicolics have grown back rather quick. Then we notice fifth end star larvae. So we extrapolate out, given the, the time of growth that's normal, about when was both position, and we track them for when they emerge about Halloween. Why is this important data? It's important because we can go and talk to the hay people and we can say, give me your history of hay. And we can say in 2013, 
There was a frost event, a mowing event. I won't drag this long out. Pretty much you can see that this little monarch had time. There was a mowing event on the 31st, and there was time to regrow the milkweed and regrow that fifth generation of monarchs before the frost came. So they squeaked through this year. But as we reconstruct the data from the, the little handwritten notebook at the farm, we find that there was no time for that. In 2015, that didn't happen. And we find that in 2014, Mowing on September 23rd, that didn't happen. No monarchs could have been made on that farm. And that farm is 100 acres with maybe 11 milkweed. And then we look back to 2013. No, we just happened to sit, come in here to this place, and catch that one event where everything lined up to produce monarchs. So now we're getting data from that place this year. We cannot control when they mow. And I can tell you the mowing was too late this year on that particular place. We've also been looking at this in native hay meadows or native prairies. You've been to the Daphne Prairie, haven't you, Ben? I know Singhurst works out there a lot. We've been working on the Daphne Prairie, and what we find is this landowner has his immaculate prairie that's never been mowed, never been grazed. And then he has this other part that he, he uses. And when we compare them and we count milkweed density, on these native prairies, we find as we count milkweeds by transect, these are basically just steps. We step it off. And we're not too uh, random. We're like, we're going to head across this meadow and count how many milkweeds we find. Or we're going to count how many larvae we find. So in the, the native part, we find lots of milkweeds. But just across the fence, we find very few. So we get some data that the landowner, the one owner, has different land management practices that are causing this huge difference. And then that brings up my question about the roadside surveys. Do you ever look across the fence and count the milkweeds that are on the other side of the fence? I found that we can walk down the highway counting milkweeds and find lots of them because TxDOT is mowing on a perfect schedule to select four milkweeds. And then we look across the fence where it's either mowed on a different schedule or grazed under a different regime and there's very few to no milkweeds. So if we just look at the highway right away, we're presenting kind of a, a false picture of milkweed density. But this could be encouraging. This could be encouraging to us because we find that we're going to present, propose that if we can get people to just modify their mowing schedule to fit this pattern, X amount of, of uh, this amount of monarchs could be produced per acre. It's kind of where we're trying to go. But we've only been at this one year. Modify your mowing to make milkweeds. And what could happen is TechDoc could do that, especially if they're areas. Well, that's why I keyed in on, on these transects that you're doing. And if they're accurately representing the milkweed density, maybe they could be used to map out mowing schedules. And the last thing we're going to do, we're looking at all the milkweeds. We've got a milkweed specialist on our team, and he's writing the Asclepias, or milkweeds of Texas. He's working with Singhurst, and we've made a few discoveries. Now, this doesn't come from us necessarily. Some of this data comes from Singhurst. Some comes from other people. We're collating, but we're also running like hell all over Texas looking at these rare milkweeds. Perborescence? Go on. Can't find it. It was one species that was up in northeast Texas. So that one could come off the list. Probably. Uncialis? A rare little milkweed out in west. It turns out it wasn't even there for there. It was a, an immature of another species that was misidentified. And the specimen is up at Brigham Young University. So that one's on the list by mistake. And we have some information that this is going to go the other way. There's a species called Hertella. It's 
very common in some of the native prairies in northeast Texas. That one has been lumped with Longifolia. So it disappeared 10 or 15 years ago. But soon it's going to be re-elevated probably. But I think you said that how can we be sure that it's gone, yeah. basically? Well, we, we, the milkweed experts look through all the records and all the herbaria, and they find that that species, uh, I think Donovan Correll found it in 1957, and it's the only time it was ever seen. And these milkweed guys are nuts. They go out on a mission, and they have combed Bowie County. And they also go and they look at aerial photos and they see that this in the 50s this was a certain kind of habitat and now it's all different. And if they give up on it and say it's no longer there, then uh, we have to believe them, especially if they publish it, which they probably will. Dr. Colson? Uh, with regard to text on the moment, uh, I have the same thought that you, we could get these guys to coordinate when they mow, and that could uh, increase habitat. And so I talked to two of those guys at Ben's meeting last week, and here's the deal on that, is that they mow twice a year if they're lucky, sometimes three times a year. In order to do that, they have 500 contractors that they have to deal with, and when they push the button on mowing, it's $23 million each time they do it. So there is no chance that we're going to be able to get to text not to be able to help them with their mowing schedule. I agree with you under the present situation, but if somebody listed the monarch and they started hammering Texas about it, and like, what are you doing about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? But, oh, well, we've, we've got a... You know, that's, the, I, that's the reality of it. And, uh, you know, they're not aware of the issue, but until somebody really does intervene in it, I don't think it's a because I visited with them as well I don't think it's that they don't want to I think like Dr. Colson said it's an ec economic feasibility yeah. reality but uh, if it was done it, it's possible that in key areas it could be done smartly because you can't start mowing toward the end of October. It's a very narrow window. Basically, look, from 10 October, basically October. Well, I know all that. Okay. Yeah, what I'm saying here is that they, they, when they make a decision to do it. It's basically winter plants versus summer plants. And when they make a decision to do it, they've got to deal with 500 contracts. So it's not going to be something that uh, can happen easily. That's the reality of it. I, I agree that's the reality, but we're paid by the comptroller to do this, so we feel like we have to come up with some options <laughs> to put on the table to be discussed. Yeah, um, we did have a uh, we did have a question online actually that I wanted to make sure we got answered. There's a question about this um, species. Um, what is this milkweed species? Amplexicolis, Asclepias amplexicolis. And then related to that, um, also Fort Hood said that they had OE samples as well, oh, awesome. so we can get you in touch with them. So, Great. okay, I think we had another question. Oh, right. Do you vet your text correspondence to be sure they can actually identify milkweed uh, monarch? Because what I find is people send me pictures all the time and say, oh, look, I found a monarch, and it's a swallow tail. <laughs> 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 We can do that because we only deal with a very limited number of people, and uh, we don't. We're not collecting like citizen scientist data, which okay. about five people that we collect data from. It's surprising to shaky it. Yeah. Have a check to know that they do what it looks like. Yes, ma'am. What's your sample size on this uh, particular graph? On this what? On this graph. On this what? graph. That's just one. One. Uh, Example on one of our hay meadows. The sample size is one. <laughs> one monarch on one plant on 100 acres, which is not, not by no means, uh, it's by no means 
statistically informative, but in, in this monarch business, uh, we think it might be an important observation at least. Because I didn't get to it, but part of what we're doing with all those 38 or 30 species of monarchs, I mean of milkweeds, <clears throat> we're scoring them as we find the species for their density on the landscape. And some of them, like tuberosa, the red one, it's like miles between any plant. And others that we tend to focus on are extremely dense, like viridis. So why is this important? Why do I show it? Just because it's one giant piece of land with basically one milkweed and one monarch found it and laid an egg on it and actually produced an adult. Thank you so well, much. You. I really appreciate that. Thank you. We um, have two more presentations to go. The next one is Dr. Um, Jeff Capatina from Texas A&M University Commerce, who will come and give us some updates on what he's doing in Northeast Texas. All right, well, I will try. I'm a pacer, <laughs> so I'm going to try to stand still as much as I can. Our uh, research is uh, up there in Northeast Texas. Uh, all of our plants are uh, Asclepius viridis. And our project is basically to look at uh, survivorship of monarch eggs and larvae in the spring. I also have some fall data that I'm going to present that we did just this past fall. Uh, and one of the potential uh, or the goals of our project is really to look at whether or not fire ants play a big role in the survivorship of monarchs. So um, we used some sort of established protocols that have been used up north. Um, basically, you find eggs on a plant and you visit that plant every single day and you monitor the fate of that egg or larva. Uh, we did that all the way up until the third instar because our pilot project that we did in 2016 indicated that once they reach the third instar, they're not necessarily going to stay on that plant. And since we cannot distinguish between emigration and mortality, we had to stop at the third instar. So all of this is in the context of uh, third instar. Uh, we were interested in a variety of things, so we collected a lot of data on uh, for the spring. All the arthropods that we observed on our daily visits on the host plants, we uh, looked at fire ant density on and around the host plant. We looked at uh, all of the arthropods that we captured in traps around the host plant. We also looked at physical attributes of the host plants themselves. And lastly, we collected leaf samples to measure cardenolines and see how that had any effect on them. We were interested in fire ants, so we did some manipulations to uh, alter the density of fire ants on the host plants. One of those involved uh, part of our study area where we broadcast uh, fire ant bait and reduced the fire ant populations in that area using that method. Then we also did this thing. We glued mealworms onto leaves to draw fire ants onto plants. Fire ants love mealworms. Okay? That's one <laughs> thing we really learned. Uh, so we were able to actually get fire ants to go onto the host plant using that technique. And of course we had controls. So we collected data on 416 eggs and larvae on 260 host plants. So here's a look at what our treatments did. So these are ants that were caught in traps around host plants. And as you can see, where we suppressed fire ants, we had 10 times fewer fire ants than were found on control plants. And where we drew them onto the plant, we had about four times as many fire ants on those plants as was found uh, on control plants. So our treatments were working, and that's good. That's always nice to know that your treatments are working. We found absolutely no relationship. So we measured the number of fire ant mounds uh, within four meters of the host plant. We measured the total volume of fire ant mounds within four meters, and we also measured the distance to the nearest fire ant mound found no relationship between any of those measures and uh, monarch survivorship. And if you look at our treatments here, you can see that where we drew fire ants onto the plant, we did get higher mortality, so lower survivorship. Uh, and I, although this is not statistically significant, I think that when we add next year's data to it and double our sample size, this will become statistically significant. So, if you can get fire ants to go onto the milkweed plant in good numbers, they will 
suppress survivorship. I think what's more interesting about this graph, though, are these two bars here, where we suppress fire ants and our controls. There's really very little difference there. So getting rid of fire ants didn't seem to improve survivorship noticeably, certainly not statistically. Uh, so I think that's actually a very important result. Uh, so turning to our uh, plant arthropods, during our daily visits, we documented 12,031 arthropods. They came from 77 different groups of arthropods. Um, there were 24 different kinds of predators on the host plants. So this is actually a very, very diverse arthropod community. I think that a lot of the literature focuses on the whole evolutionary arms race between the herbivores and the milkweed plants. But what we largely seem to ignore is the fact that those plants bloom and they produce copious amounts of nectar and they attract copious numbers of arthropods. So a lot of these predators that are on this plant, they're not looking for monarchs. They're not specifically looking for milkweed herbivores. They're looking for things coming into the flowers for nectar and they're catching them that way. So 24 different kinds of predators most of which have either been documented eating monarchs or we observed eating monarchs. So a very rich predator population. Uh, the three most abundant plants on the uh, arthropods on the plants were all predators. So fire ants were on the top, little black ants, monomorum minimum, and jumping spiders, salticidae. So there's the jumping spiders doing what they do. They eat monarchs. Um, and so even though fire ants were the most abundant arthropods, 31% of all the arthropods that we saw were fire ants, they were not actually the most frequent <coughs> predators on those plants. The most frequent predators on those plants were actually jumping spiders. The jumping spiders are found on almost 60% of our host plants, whereas fire ants a little less than half. So more than one predator. Fire ants, we have failed to find any real relationship yet. But there were nine different kinds of milkweed herbivores on these plants as well. The most common one being the uh, large milkweed bug, uh, which represented the fourth most common of all the arthropods on our plants. Uh, we did have two queens in the spring, which was kind of odd. But by and large, queens are a very minor component to this system. So most of the species that we documented were actually um, rather uncommon, which is kind of typical when you look at high diverse, a lot of diverse communities, it's typically a lot of rare species. Um, so 55 of the 77 different types of arthropods were found on less than 10% of the plants. Uh, fire ant treatment alters the community <coughs> dynamics. So if we look at this graph here, this is based on the Shannon entropy index, where we're measuring effective species. It's very low where we threw fire ants off of those plants. It's very high where we suppress fire ants. So fire ants do have an effect on the community dynamics. They also affect evenness, which increases with decreasing fire ant density. So that's kind of interesting. At this point, I would like to point out that there are some issues with data structure. All right, so we have 364 lar eggs and larvae that we used in this particular analysis. Uh, that means that since our mortality rate, our survivorship was about 15%, we only have 53 individuals that survived. Right? So when you're doing a statistical analysis of survivorship, that's 53 responses. Right? And we have 77 arthropods. And you can't really have more predictors than you have responses in a statistical model really difficult to predict anything when you have more predictions than you have responses. So that's a problem. The other problem is all of those species where there's 10% occurrence, that means that there are over 330 zeros in your data set and about 30 positives, right? So you have extraordinarily sparse data. And there are all kinds of issues with running sparse data in logistic regression. One of them is that you tend to overestimate your predictors. And so what we did was we tried to combine as much as possible uh, groups of ecologically similar organisms. And so we can reduce our number of groups that way. 
and increase the density of our data. So I just wanted to point out that that's one of the things that we did. And I'm going to talk a little bit about data. So one of the first things we did was just do simple pairwise comparisons. What this graph is, or this chart is telling you is this is, these numbers here are survivorship. So 21% survivorship here, two thirds and stuff. Uh, this is when a particular arthropod listed over here was present, and when they were absent, and here's the p-value. So three of these are actually statistically significant. These are all either significant or near significant results. And so if we look at um, leaf beetles, Chrysomelidae, the survivorship when those beetles were present was uh, almost three times as high as when they were absent. A lot of that has to do with the fact that these guys are attracted to flowers, they're nectar. Uh, same thing with, well, bees, obviously, are attracted to flowers. When bees are present, the survivorship is actually higher. And surprisingly enough, ladybugs, when there were ladybugs on the plant, survivorship was high, almost twice as high, which is kind of odd. And in fact, if you look at all of these values, when the arthropods are present, survivorship is higher than when it's active. The only exception to that are the unidentified hemiptera, which had the opposite trend. Now I'd point out that unidentified hip Hemiptera is kind of a nebulous group. <laughs> so there could be predators in there, there could be herbivores in there. Right, so um, we then ran a logistic regression on our arthropod groups. And our results, this is the best model we could come up with. It's not a very good model. Uh, one of the things that comes up in this model is that little black ants may have a negative impact on modern survivorship. You may notice that fire ants don't show up in here, though. They weren't contributing to this model at all. The only thing that actually contributes really to this model is all of our non predatory If we take all of our non predatory arthropods and lump them together, they have a positive impact on survivorship. All right, so. Um, this model isn't a very powerful model. It's a very weak model. Yesterday, just before I came here, I decided to stratify the data into plants that had high arthropod densities and plants that had low arthropod densities. And when I do that and I look at plants that have lots of arthropods on them, this effect becomes much more significant. When we look at plants that have very low densities of arthropods, predators actually become more important, and they have a negative impact on survivorship. So there is a density-dependent thing going on with this system. So that's kind of the conclusion that I'm going to draw from that for now. And I'd like to point out also that this data is all very preliminary. When we can double our sample size and go from 53 that survived to 106, we'll have much more powerful statistical tests to base that on. Uh, so, where are we now here? Let's look at the arthropods that we caught in the traps. So as we're moving away from the host plant, we're getting sort of more peripheral relationships. And uh, we captured in those traps 28,545 different arthropods. They belong to 68 different arthropod groups. Uh, and there was 23 different kinds of predators in there. So the 10 most frequent arthropods, three of those were predators. Wolf spiders, fire ants, and a group that we just called small spiders. They were mostly unidentified. Fire ants uh, were by far the most abundant predators. They were everywhere. Uh, wolf spiders, though, were actually more frequent. So 97% of our host plants had wolf spiders in the immediate vicinity of the plant. If we look at um, other common arthropods that include mostly small flies, aphids, mites, small parasitic wasps, crickets, thrips, and leaf hoppers. Again, because we have so many different arthropod groups, we try to group ecologically similar organisms together to get better statistical resolution. And then we ran all this in the uh, logistic regression, stepwise model. 
We had five significant models. This is the best model based on the uh, AIC criterion. And over here we can see that it has three groups that contribute to this model. Mites, uh, wolf spiders, grass spiders, and nursery red web spiders, and crickets. And these two groups, mites and the predatory spiders, they have a positive relationship with survivors. So more wolf spiders, better survivorship for a month. Uh, crickets, on the other hand, have a negative relationship. I'm not exactly sure how to interpret that because I think there may be a sampling artifact here. So we're going to have to look at that data more closely. And again, when we get more data next spring, we should be able to resolve these, some of these issues. All right, so here's a... Uh, that's the thing. All right, so it's plant characteristics. We had all kinds of plant characteristics that we measured. And again, we used uh, step one <coughs> regression to look at what plant characteristics were most positively or negatively associated with monarch survivorship. And this model is our best model. It was also statistically significant. And it has three parameters number of ramets, total length of ramets, and a leaf miner index. We had lots of leaf miners on some of our plants, not so many on other plants. The most significant parameter in this model is the total length of ramps. And it's positive length, so still plants with greater overall ramp length are more likely to support surviving monarch. <coughs> the number of ramps is actually negatively correlated, but it is still really quite a weak response, and I'm not sure how to interpret that yet. It could actually be another sampling artifact, because the larva on a plant that has a lot of ramps may be more easily um, to, to, to miss when you're doing the survey. So it could be that it was documented with dead and well, dead. Uh, and then this parameter here is um, got a really, really high coefficient. And the confidence interval of this parameter was infinity. So that's a classic sign of uh, sparse data bias. And so I would completely ignore that parameter for now. Hopefully, when we get more data, we can have denser data that will give us better statistical resolution. Okay, and so the last thing with the spring data that I want to talk about are cardenolites. So what we did was we collected leaves from host plants that had monarch eggs or larva on them. And we collected leaves from adjacent plants that appear to be completely untouched. So what I was kind of interested in was why did the female lay an egg on this plant and not that plant, right? So the plants are right next to each other. Why is one plant favored over the other? Or are they favored? So if we look at this data, and by the way, this is very preliminary data, because if you look at the sample sizes on the bottom, they're really, really small. So the only significant thing on this is entire graph is this comparison here. And most plants that had eggs on them, that females laid eggs on, had lower cardenolide content than adjacent plants. So they do appear to be selected. And they're selecting plants with lower cardenolides. Uh, it's a little early to interpret these other bars, but it looks to me like these plants with the largest a lot survive have slightly higher cardenolides, and I think that's because when the larvae start browsing on the plant, they cause an induction of cardenolides, and I think that's what you're seeing here, induced cardenolides. Right, so moving right along, our, our cardenolide content, by the way, was right almost exactly where all the other literature values were for this species of plant, the collective bird. So let's talk about fall. Fall, we started um, middle of August. We actually observed eggs, monarch eggs, and larvae at the end of July. I don't know where they're coming from, because we're way up in North Texas, so we're not really on the Gulf where the resident population is supposed to be. And we're not really far enough north that they would be fourth generations. So I don't know where they're coming from. Uh, we started in the middle of August looking at eggs, and we finished uh, last week in October. 
So it was a fairly lengthy period of time. And during that period of time, we worked on a piece of property south of Sulphur Springs, and this is where that mowing comes in. We couldn't work in our usual site at Cooper Lake because they don't mow that area and they don't burn it in the summer. So all of the milkweed on that site was overgrown and died back. This site, though, was mowed at the end of June, and this is what it looked like uh, in the middle of August. So it had great abundance of milkweeds. One thing you will notice about this field, there are no flowers in this field. It's all grass and milkweeds, pretty much. So uh, lots of eggs, though. We had 245 eggs on 207 plants. Here's what our survivorship looked like. It was terrible at least compared to our spring survivorship. So um, there is a slight tendency for eggs to have higher um, mortality or yeah, higher mortality, lower survivorship than either the first or second instar. By the time we get to the third instar, we only have about 2.8, 2.85% survivorship. So if we compare that with our spring data, where is that spring data? There it is. You can see there's quite a bit of difference there. So in the spring, we got about 15.5% surviving to the third instar. In the fall, this fall, only about 2.85%, so much lower. One difference, rainfall. We had, on average, in our area, we get about 2.8 inches of rain in September. This September, we had one one hundredth of an inch. So it was extremely dry, and our plants were very, very stressed throughout that period. So that could contribute to that difference. Or, I don't know, maybe that's just the way fall survivorship is. We don't really know yet. So to put all of this into context, as far as the survivorship data goes, all of those black bars on the uh, left side are the data that we've collected for spring at our study site. One is our pilot study in 2016, and then you have our controls, and then the other high bars are suppressed. And you can see that all of our survivorship data is much higher than most of the data that's recorded for other studies. Okay, So we're doing pretty good, I guess. Calvert, back in 2004, had fairly high survivorship as well. But we're doing clearly much better than Minnesota which is interesting. And even if you look at our fall survivorship, that is fairly comparable to at least these two other studies. So I don't know how that fits into the whole context. I suspect that spring monarchs in Texas are supposed to have good survivorship because I suspect that that's how the population rebounds after the overwintering period. Fall survivorship, I think that's just sort of bonus reproduction. Uh, we don't really know what happens to those individuals that um, come out of the fall reproductive event. So here's what my concluding remarks are going to be. First of all, all of this subject to change as we get more samples and stabilize our rather unstable data set. Uh, spring survivorship is very high, and that's, I guess, probably good news. Um, it peaks, by the way, I didn't show the slide, but we find that our survivorship is actually much highest in the last two weeks of April. Early April, low. Last two weeks of April, really high. May, somewhat lower. Right? So there is a window during which the monarchs um, do best in the spring. So fire ants don't seem to have a big impact on spring survivorship. And that's probably very important, because if you're going to manage you might want to keep that in mind. Uh, our Asclepius veritas community is a very rich community as far as arthropods go. And I think that that's very important when it comes to monarch survivorship. Um, fire ants are one of only 23 predators. And that might be why we don't really see a big effect. Because if the fire ants don't eat them, something else does. And so that's probably why monarchs lay so many eggs because they live in a very stochastic system that has very high mortality rate. And putting your finger on one single factor may not be the way it works. It's just not how it works in that system. Uh, the most important predator, which is based on frequency, might actually be jumping spiders. Uh, modern survival seems to increase on plants that have really good 
rich arthropod communities, I think there may be some predator swamping that takes place on those plants. And survival is also higher on plants that have longer runs, but not necessarily more runs. Females choose plants with lower carnal lines, and fall monarch survivor is shifting the most. Okay, so here are what I think are the management implications of this study. First of all, controlling fire ants might not be your first strategy. I don't think it's cost effective. I don't think that that's really a way you should be targeting your efforts. Number two, I think that you need to develop a diverse plant community that has a diverse arthropod community, right? Native vegetation is great, but there are probably also other exotic species that can fulfill the same or similar ecological role in some cases. So mowing schedule, as was already mentioned, I think is a really good way of uh, promoting milkweeds in some of these diverse communities, along with burning. If you do winter burns, you'll get lots of milkweed. And lastly, we need to do more work on fall monarch reproduction. Um, and again, that's also very clearly altered by mowing schedule because we couldn't work on one site simply because it doesn't get mowed. We could do a lot of work on another site because it gets mowed. Right? And so that mowing provides the regeneration that we need to support that fall reproduction. Uh, there's my field assistants. I had a lot of assistants on this project. Um, I've got four students now working on master's thesis for this project. So hopefully they'll get that done. And with that, I'll ask the questions. Any questions? Yes? So if you were comparing survival from your study to the other existing studies in literature, was that compared to survival through your big star and then Right, yeah, so those... Can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the question was, when I was comparing my survivorship rates with other studies, were they based on the same methodology? Well, based on just a third study. Just a third, yes, it was all just a third in star. Yeah, so I selected those studies because they went to the third in star. So I could do a direct comparison that way. Other questions? Yes, sir. You know, I don't know. Because the 2.8% survival rate is an increase in population size. Even though that's a small number, it's yes. one to one they're still increasing. Yes. I, I would agree with that. Although, if you project that out to the fifth in star, it gets down to 1.4%. Uh, and then if you start factoring in mortality, it gets lower and lower as you go further down. But yeah, it's still fairly good, considering how many eggs they lay. Yes? I'm sorry if I missed it, but are your survival estimates per plant, or is it per site? It is per plant. Well, it's actually per individual. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Dr. Taylor's on home, but he um, had a discussion with me earlier this year about July monarch. Right. Might he believes that if they haven't gone north out of Texas by said, June 6th, a window right in there, they don't go north anymore. Right. They just stay. So we okay. have some that were bottled up by north winds this year in North Texas. Okay, so that would explain things because I did see monarchs, well, I saw a monarch in June this we, year. We saw them all through the summer in North Texas. Okay, yeah, so that would explain a lot. The other thing that I noticed, and I don't know, it's very anecdotal, was that some of the monarchs that I saw at the beginning of August, they looked really small. And I was just wondering if maybe there's some summer reproduction and that they just didn't do very well. Other questions? Yes? So with, uh, in one of your charts, uh, when you're looking at survivorship, and there was also three other models talking about the gems that were survivorship, and those were present. Yes. Do you have an idea about why you think those three particular, I know for the very, uh, but for maybe the animal spiders, eating them instead of the larvae, or? That's what I think is going on. So, as I said, when I stratify my data into high density and low density, the number of arthropods seem to swarm out, they, they saturate the predators. 
So I think what's happening is that the predators are going after those things that are coming into the flowers, and so they're hanging out around the flowers. And the monarchs do too, but the monarchs typically are closer to the stem and they're not right on the flower per se. Whereas you look at um, jumping spiders, they like to camp out right next to the flowers. The same with the link spiders will actually sit on the flower waiting for things to come in. So they're obviously staking out the flowers, and so I think that's what's happening. And if they get hungry and there's nothing coming to the flowers, they'll probably start roaming around looking for other things. That's pretty anthropomorphic, but <laughs> it's kind of what I think is going on. Okay, we had one more question online. The question was, how do you tell the difference between the monarch and the queen eggs? Right, so that data that I presented for the fall, we had nine queens in there. And for now, they're just all lumped in together. Uh, there are two sort of anecdotal accounts in the literature that say that queens have more oblong eggs. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take pictures next to you and we're going to collect some eggs and we're going to see if you can use the ratio width to height to tell eggs apart. But for now, we have no way of distinguishing monarch from queen eggs. Uh, as, for, as far as the spring goes, we only had two queens in the spring. I was a bit surprised at that because I didn't think we had queens at all in the spring in North Texas. Um, but because there's only two of them, I don't think that's a, a major source of bias in our data. Um, we did have quite a few queens in the, in the fall, and we're still figuring out how to kind of tease those two things apart, because they are hard to tell apart, especially the eggs. First instars, they can be hard to tell, but you start seeing those extra tubercles appearing as little dots on the backs of those first instars after a day or two. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. And now we are um, to our last university, um, Texas A&M University at Col College Station. Dr. Robert Colson is the lead um, PI on that and has several of his staff and partners in the room to provide an update. What we're going to do today is talk about monarch species distribution modeling and risk assessment. Uh, the partners on this are Kristen Baum, who is inappropriately uh, titled here. Uh, Kristen was uh, promoted to the rank of professor this year at Oklahoma State University. <laughs> a, a significant milestone in an academic career. James Tracy, who is a student at A&M, and Tula Cantola is a research associate with A&M, and Mike Quinn, who is a, a survey entomologist that's worked with us. The, what I'm going to present to you today, the heavy lifting on this was done by James and Tula, and the, they're suffering jet lag. They were in Denver yesterday and just arrived at the airport today. So I'm going to try to get through and describe uh, basically their work uh, that relates to uh, our project. And the, I mean, the overall goal of this is in, in when we conceptualize this project, we said, well, if we want to look at assessing the risk of uh, mortality to uh, monarch butterflies, there were three things that we really had to do. We had to know where the insect was, and in that end, there, there are two angles to that. One is when they're going north, and then the other one's when they're coming south. And our, is that spatial location the same place? And what is it? And then the, the third thing is, is, what are the various risk factors that the insect encounters either going into the north or coming back from the south? And so the way we propose to go about doing this is to, well, what I'm going to report to you today is to do look at three things. One is the model the fall phenophase, that is the migration back into Texas, and then to look at uh, some of the risk factors, herbicide uh, and um, exposure, uh, and changes of um, uh, uh, herbicide exposure, and then the, the change in, in the um, yeah, ecoregions as they move through, and then also looking at pesticide exposure to basically adults and larvae. Do I have to stand in front of this this microphone, or can I move? If you can, can you pull it out close? and hold it. Huh? You can pull it out and hold it. I'll let you know if I need you to get Rock closer back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do here is look at the adult. We're going to look at the adult fall phenophase 
We're going to look at herbicide and land use threats to milkweeds and then pesticide exposure to milkweeds. And so basically the, the issues here that we're dealing with are uh, widespread milkweed and prairie habitat loss to cropland conversions and then potential impacts from pesticides and roadkill mortality. One of the uh, uh, aspects of our work is actually a survey that deals with roadkills, actually measuring roadkills. So what I want to do here is talk first about uh, the fall migration roost models and then next is a modeling approach. And then the second thing we'll do is look at the uh, milkweed species models uh, and, and the approaches that were used to uh, do both of those modeling efforts. Okay, we've reported on this before. This is the phenophase mid model. And uh, this is the original Journey North Monarch Overnight Roost data. Uh, that, um, and what this shows is two things. One is the, if you'll pay attention to these, well, let me back up a minute and say, uh, I could teach a 15 week course on the amount of information that James has put in these slides. So I'm trying to hydrate what's important to you here uh, without trying to go through this uh, in great detail. So I'm going to cut short a little bit of the detail. But anyway, this is the, uh, the, the this line here represents the background evaluation extent used in the modeling. And these two approaches, James used two approaches in modeling. Uh, this roost data. One of them uh, is called is a maxent model, uh, a niche model, and basically that model uses climatic, adaptive, and topographic variables uh, in relation to where uh, the insect is known to occur. The other approach uh, is a what's called a kernel density estimate, a KDE model, and basically this is a point pattern analysis. A kernel is a, is a cluster uh, of data points. And the surprising thing about that, in the fall migration, it turned out that this uh, the KDE model actually provided uh, a better view of the, of the migration than did the uh, model that used the, the climatic and adaptive and topographic variables. And there's some logical reasons that, uh, for that. But anyway, this is the one that we actually went with in terms of uh, describing the fall, or that we think does the best job of describing the fall migration. So this is the central and eastern flyaway divisions for fungal monarch migration. And there are a couple of interesting things about this that are important. One is that that flyaway varies in terms of its size and spatial extent each year. And so uh, James and Tula could, could tease that out. And you can see each of the years uh, that the extent of that flyaway uh, changes. Now, that's important when you start to look when we get a little bit farther and start looking at mortality agents, uh, how large or how small that flyaway is has a great deal to do with how much mortality is going to occur along the way. Uh, this is a 13 is a particularly interesting year. That's the narrowest one, but you can see it floats around year to year. Okay, so what I want to show you now is the uh, the kernel density estimate model for. Uh, this is the conclusion that we reached. So this core area right here is uh, basically the 100% consensus boundary. Uh, it indicates the core fall migration rate. So if you wanted to do something significant in terms of conservation or preservation, or, uh, then that would be the area that you would want to uh, put your focus to, we think. All right, now another interesting thing that follows from this is, is that the timing of when the insect moves north to south is really important. So for example, uh, and that, that's what this figure here shows. It shows the, uh, what we're doing is progressing down uh, from the north to the south, and this shows where the populations are as they're moving south. Now that, the reason that that's important, and the same thing is true with it going north, is that, for example, if we were looking at the impact of, uh, of pesticide exposure, uh, when the insect is there relative to when the pesticide is being applied would be really important. Uh, I'll give you a, a specific example is that one that we just recently found out is, is that uh, pesticides are used on pecan trees in the fall. And pecan trees are common roost sites for uh, monarch butterflies. So when that after when the 
pesticides are being applied versus when the, uh, the insect is there it could be really important or is important. So this shows the temporal uh, movement uh, uh, based upon what the model results show. All right. All right. So let's look next at the the uh, the, the next thing we want to do is model uh, uh, the distribution and abundance of milkweed plants. And so what we're going to do is look at uh, a basically using the same approach. In, in this case, the uh, 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 Maxent model. And what we want to do is map the distribution of the major host milkweed species uh, in, in monarch immature records in the uh, south central U.S. And again, we're going to use uh, a niche modeling approach to do that. Now this, I'm, I'm going to try to highlight, again, we're using the Maxent model uh, based upon the milkweed species core habitat associated with 30 meter resolution national land cover data set. And so, uh, and then other data sources have also been used for that. The Journey North, the Monarch Larva, Larva Project, uh, iNaturalist, uh, our working group here, uh, uh, Dr. Bush and Dr. Baum have created uh, or, or provided some of the data, and Mike Quinn and our group has done, and also some herbarium data has been used for that as well. All right, I'm going to really cut the chase on this because basically what we're really interested in is, well, there are five species of milkweed that uh, we intend to model, two of which we have modeled. I'm saying we in a very general way. Uh, uh, James and Tula have modeled this. And so really what I want to do is show you the results of that modeling and then the other three species you'll pick up later. But green antelope horn, most common species, uh, particularly abundant in overgrazed pastures, roadsides, and disturbed grounds in Texas. This is the distribution of that, of the data points for the observations of it. The other one is antelope corn, and it has a, a slightly different distribution. And again, and there are other species that have been brought up today that uh, eventually we'll get to a couple more of these, but the ones that we want to focus on are these. So this is the uh, niche model that demonstrates the distribution of green antelope corn. And this is the actual core, the maximum 100% consensus model representing core habitat for green antelope corn. And when you and pay attention to that, and you can look at the part that comes across Texas and where that is. And then if you look at, uh, at antelope corn, you can see that the distribution has moved a little bit to the left. But there's certainly a great deal of overlap between those two species. Now that, when we, when we get, in a minute, I'm going to get over and show you some um, uh, cartoons that deal with pesticide exposure. And so I try to keep this in mind with regard to where these host plants are, because that's going to become important in a minute. And so this is basically taking the data on the distribution of those two species and placing it over the land use cover, land use types, uh, of the flyway, and this, this figure here shows you where the species occur in each of the different land use uh, uh, categories. All right, so what can we conclude? The highest core milkweed habitat loss was associated with urban and cultivated crop losses. Some loss in habitat can be associated with pasture hay land cover. Uh, we regard the uh, least risk of habitat loss to be associated with grassland herbaceous shrub, uh, uh, grassland herbaceous and shrub shrub land cover, and we expect that the loss of core habitat is going to increase over time. All right, so now let's look at, at herbicides and pesticides. The pesticide threat to adults and larvae. Uh, many of you may have seen this uh, publication in Science recently which paints a really um, uh, terrible picture of the effects of neonicotinoids and fungicides on honeybees near corn. And it's a pretty compelling uh, story. And, it, it, and basically it was organized around looking at longevity of insects, hygienes, lane queens, LD50s. And it makes a, a pretty convincing story that uh, pesticide exposure is having a major impact on this other important uh, 
uh, the pollinator. Now, what James did on this thing is took a little bit. Well, let me let me back up and say where this could be important with monarchs is here is feeding on aphid honeydew and pecan orchards in the fall. As I mentioned to you, this is uh, a, a, a crop or uh, an orchard tree that uh, is treated with pesticides that time of year or in the fall. Uh, nectaring on flowering plants such as canola, uh, nectaring near field crop borders or cattle feedlots, and larval feeding on milkweed crops near cattle feedlots. These are areas where the exposure can be uh, uncommonly large or high. Now this is a little bit of a, of a jump in terms of, uh, of correlations. This is an association. You can look at the, uh, the increase in the mimic-chlorophids uh, pesticide use over time. And you can see this actually goes up. And you can see that the, uh, this is the uh, distribution of use of that pesticide in 1990, those pesticides in 1996. In 2014, you can see it. Well, look at the member I asked you to take. Remember the, the flyway and where the milkweed plants were? You can see that's in that pretty good. Now, what this is showing may not be related. Uh, this top graph also uh, is representative of the enrollment at Texas A&M over the same period of time. <laughs> so whether they're related to one another is, is, is debatable, but it certainly is a pretty compelling uh, core of, coincidence if it's not a, a relationship. And the same thing is true with glyphosate. Uh, if you look at glyphosate use, as that has increased over the years, you can't look at it in Texas, uh, covering the, uh, uh, the flyway could be uh, a very significant issue. And so the last thing I want to do is talk about uh, the phenology of monarch breeding in Texas in order to evaluate pesticide risk. Now, we have to know when the insect is present. Uh, in order to be able to assess its risk to pesticide exposure. So basically, this what we're looking at is modeling pheno season along with the pheno region. And so this basically is a, is a, a, a cartoon that shows monarch coast records uh, at the, in the different pheno regions. These are the pheno regions that we think are important. Uh, and this is the, these are the uh, milkweed species that are associated with each one of those pheno regions. And these are the data, or this, this cartoon illustrates the data on observations of larvae and pupae in South Central uh, U.S. And the idea here is for us to be able to use, in this case, certainly the Maxent model that combines the climatic adaptive and topographic variables using that model to model the uh, 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 larvae and pupal survival in that area. Okay, any questions? All right, let's have no sums. <laughs> well, I've noticed that uh, in our area, we have a lot of people who grow hay. And they spray those aphids a lot. In fact, milkweed is one of the things they target. And I guess I'm wondering if that's one of the main groups that want to be exposed to some of these pesticides. Well, that's, the, the trick is, the answer is yes, okay, and I think the, uh, the significant issue is, is where, when are the pesticides being applied in relation to when is the insect present? Uh, we did a study one time on Houston toads and their potential exposure to pesticide treatments from uh, mosquito control. And it turned out that, they, that, that the toad lived in areas where pesticide exposure could be a problem, but not at the time when it was in a tadpole or an egg stage, and so it didn't really have any effect. So that timing between when the insect is there and when the pesticides are there is important. And of course, the other thing is the residual of the pesticide. And I think in the case of this Theo Nicotin thing, that was one of the, uh, the poignant discoveries that was made in terms of honeybees, that, that there is a significant residual that uh, uh, end up, ends up affecting honeybees. You asked me this question, I'm going to ask you. <laughs> At what point can you tell the farmer that he has to modify what he's doing? When the thing's listed as endangered, does he have to do anything? Well, the, the short answer is, is that I'm working for the controller's office who, uh, 
No, the, the idea here, for, from our perspective, is this, is to, to illustrate and to demonstrate what the, what the mortality issues are, what the risk factors are. Okay, and that information is to be used for the species status assessment. That, that's what we're, the, 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 that's our target for what we're doing here. And how that, how these data are, are practically applied uh, is, is going to be the charge of other people besides us. What we're trying to do is identify the reality with regard to the risk factors for monarch migration north and south. And if we can provide, you know, factual information in that regard, then, then that's when we've done our, our job here. And then the application of that in the real world, you know, the TxDOT thing, we thought we were on something really big by going to TxDOT and saying, well, let us help you um, uh, modify your voting schedule until I found out just what a horrible nightmare that is to do. And so, they, so, the, so the practical application of this uh, is going to be somebody else's problem. What we're trying to do is inform the species status assessment. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Colson. So I'm going to talk about our work with uh, fifth generation monarchs. Um, I didn't put quotations around fifth generation for this uh, talk, but again, I don't know that we know what generation the monarchs are, but again, focusing on those monarchs that are present. Uh, in the southern region in the fall uh, and you know, sort of 20 <coughs> weeks prior to migration. Um, and I'm also going to talk about um, uh, overwintering and in particular winter breeding monarchs as well. Um, so our tasks in terms of the project uh, for the Texas Comptroller's Office are to look at habitat use both by the fifth generation um, and those that are here in the to her. Uh, look at the contribution of the fifth generation to the overwintering population in Mexico, um, and also looking at the impact of the needs. And the needs are our studies that we have, um, so we kind of looked at other projects that were funded and tried to kind of avoid areas that were already covered. Um, so you can see that kind of a cluster of sites that you know, you know, Abilene, and the Austin Curve, and area, and then kind of along the Gulf Coast here. And at each of these locations, we've got what we would call a mostly natural site, um, so kind of rangeland, hay field, you know, something where it's kind of a larger area uh, with data milk wheat. Um, you've got road sites that you try to kind of line up with this natural site. Um, and then the, the tropical sites are those with tropical milk wheat uh, for that emphasis on the, the winter breeding or um, overwintering on the and so I thought for today it would help to kind of phrase things in the context when I put my talk together for the monarch joint mission meeting. I talked about you know, what do people really know about, what do you know about those fifth generation monarchs? And so I kind of shifted everything and kind of reorganized and put the data in, in the context of my talk earlier today. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge David. We had David sightings um, while I've been here. <laughs> uh, people have put up hands to David, but he's um, finishing up our field season, so that would be the other thing. Uh, we, of course, completed a field season um, last year, so all that data is in here, but I've also completed that before, but we're still finishing up that fall season. Um, we have not started the, the winter breeding or wintering season. Uh, so I've got some kind of preliminary data in there, but again, that's still in progress. And we still have lots of uh, caterpillars and crystals to, to finish up to have something more concrete for 2017. Um, so I wanted to look at timing of activity. So I um, looked at data from last year, and so I've got it grouped kind of by those different regions. So just to simplify, some labeled in the valley, also in South Texas. Um, so this is what we looked at um, last year. So for the Abilene area, we had this you know, really clear peak um, in early October. Um, and here it's the percent of late instars that we collected, so kind of putting it in context for each site, so the percent of the great instars that were collected at those sites. Um, and then you can see for Austin, South Texas. And so I did what I did um, this morning and looked at when are those peak migration periods. Um, of course, migration extends both earlier and later than that, which is nice to have kind of a target date to, to look at. Um, and so for the Athlete area, the midpoint would be kind of October 9th and 10th. Uh, the 15th for Austin, Kerrville, and then uh, the 18th for South Texas. So you can kind of look at how all that falls out 
Uh, and just for comparison, we threw in the data from North Central Oklahoma. Uh, so there, our peak migration kind of lines up really well when you see the um, activity and late in star activity. Um, those should be emerging in time to join that peak migration. But then I think as you move farther south, there's a little bit more flexibility in terms of that timing. They've got you know, a, a shorter distance to travel um, in terms of making it to an overwintering site. So you can see we've got a little bit of, of different patterns there. And so, and of course, the migration's been released um, for several years now. Um, and this year, um, it was quite late. So, uh, so you know, those dates have you know, probably shifted a good bit if you think about just when are the migrants moving through those two areas. And so, um, and I will say for our uh, data from North Central Oklahoma, where we've done the most tagging over the uh, past couple of years, uh, you know, we've had tag recoveries from monarchs moving through that area that are two and a half weeks after that, that peak migration date. Um, again, a lot of times I said that the migration was late, so again, you would still expect to, to pick up um, some recaptures or know that, that some of those monarchs are going to make it to the overwintering site. So I have seven minutes of data for 2017. Um, again, it's still in progress, and I could kind of cut off at some point so I can summarize, uh, summarize data. And again, this is all based on uh, the late in stars, um, so looking at fourth and fifth. Uh, and so in this year, we did something a little bit different. You know, last year, we kind of made it through three full cycles of different sites. Um, and this year, we tried to hit those two week intervals. And so that way, if you're going back to a site every two weeks, you know, the eggs that we have that first visit should end up being late in stars the, the next visit. And so we try really hard to kind of fit with that two week interval so we have some data on survival estimates from eggs and star to go with our late in star to adult survival estimates. Um, so it's been making it a little bit tricky to kind of interpret that timing, um, but it does seem like um, in some cases it might be less of a, a peak or a little bit of a different pattern uh, this year. But again, you know, once we can add in the rest of the field season. Uh, it'll make a lot more sense. Um, and in terms of habitat use by pre migrants, um, this morning I talked about um, you know, how our densities in the spring compared to the fall. Um, so in North Central Oklahoma, we've got anywhere from 0% to 17% of the densities we had in the spring. So much lower densities of milkweed in the fall than we have in the spring. Um, and we did some spring surveys and we're trying to match it up to the data from this fall. Um, national chances so we can do more of a direct comparison. Um, but if you look at uh, kind of the main species that we have that we're collecting late in stars from at our, our different sites, you know, if you look at Asperola and Viridis, uh, those you know, we tend to see much higher densities in the spring than in the fall. Um, Latifolia and Mimithoroides um, was kind of the opposite, so based on when we did our spring surveys, we actually had higher densities. Um, in our fall surveys, um, then Incarnac was about the same in both periods, and then Prentice, we don't have a lot of sites, um, but presumably about the same. So what we need to go, go back through is go up and match with management practices of the sites because that will influence what we see then um, as well. But we did do around the spring surveys so we can get an idea of what the densities are in the spring so we can compare to the densities in the fall because we do have a lot of senescence. Uh, but compared to our data in Oklahoma, we've got a lot more in terms of species diversity and, and different plants that are milkweed plants that are being used by these fifth generation monarchs. And so um, fly parasitism, um, I was going to look at it as well. Um, so our Texas data, so again, last year was the first year um, we had um, data. So we had about 404 late starts we collected, and about half of those um, died from flies. Uh, this year, Again, we've still got a lot in progress, and so we don't know the answer yet. But um, and so the, the, the sample size will be a lot higher, but roughly about a third of what we collected is what we're seeing so far. I presented the Oklahoma data um, uh, this morning, and I wanted to throw that out because it covers about six years and uh, 1,500 million stars. Our average is about 41 percent, uh, with a range of either 21 percent to 64 percent, depending on the year. Um, and in comparison to uh, the recent uh, paper out of Karen Oberhauser's lab that's based on uh, data from Citizen Science, which is part of the NLP project, um, if you look at that, um, I think I took one of their graphs and tried to make an estimate for the, the fourth and fifth and stars combined, um, since that's what we collect. But there, you're know, looking across the breeding range and across the breeding season, survival was estimated at about 16% um, for those late in stars. 
and 98% across all life stages. So again, this would suggest that Tinkin and fly parasitism could be more of an issue for these late um, uh, monarchs, or these fifth generation monarchs, than perhaps it is for the other, other generations. Um, and then I also uh, threw in our OE data as well. Um, and I'm not sure what that's with my slide, but um, uh, some of the text is shifting around. Uh, but this was looking at um, the percent infected. So, and I did calculate this based on only the number that survived to adulthood, so that took out a lot that, that died as flies. Um, and so the orange bars are the fifth generation. Again, this is our Oklahoma data. I'll throw up the, the Texas data in a minute. Um, but usually, you know, about less than 10 percent of our fifth generation monarchs in Oklahoma are infected. And then these gray bars here are the number of migrants moving through that we've tagged and collected those samples from, and uh, some other data as well. Um, and so it looks there to be a big difference. Um, but if you look at the um, monarch health data, um, and I pulled a recent paper that had some data and looked at the most recent 10 years that were easily accessible. Um, and so their average across the breeding season is, is 8.7%. But again, you would expect to see an increase in that average across the entire breeding season. Um, but if you think about Oklahoma and Texas, in a lot of cases, you know, the milky that these fifth generation monarchs are using is either regrowth, you know, from we talked about burning and, and hanging and growing. Um, and so, um, so that would remove any spores that might be present so we don't have that accumulation. Um, areas where they're going to be more present um, you know, year-round is going to be a different type of scenario. So throwing up our Texas data, um, so we had over half of our late in stars to I comply last year. So we only had 173 that we could sample for only, but our um, infection rate was 17% for those fifth generation monarchs, so that's higher than what we saw um, in Oklahoma. Um, but again, you think about it being late in the breeding season, um, you expect those, um, those levels to be somewhat higher. Um, and then we don't have a lot of data yet for 2017, um, so it's kind of partial season, um, but we're about at 12.5% um, right now. Um, and so this is our winter breeding data from uh, last year. Obviously, we haven't gotten to that season yet for 2017. Um, and so I organized this um, by the percent of individuals that fell into each category. So this is a little bit different than how I presented the other data because I wanted everything to add up to 100%. So before when I did like the OE estimates, you know, I took out all those that died from flies, right? Because we didn't know if they had OE or not. Um, so in this case, it's a little bit different because it's, they're adding up to 100. Um, but and these are going to be those those Gulf Coast studies where we've got topical OE. Uh, but we can see for our December um, sampling period, uh, we had 89 latent stars, um, and then only about 15% that emerged as um, healthy uh, butterflies. Um, really high fly mortality uh, at that point, about 70%. Um, and I think I threw in, um, so OE looks really low because, you know, yeah, I'm adding up to 100, but you just take the percent of OE based on the number that actually survived to adulthood. And about a third of those um, would have been infected with cancer unknown deaths as well. Uh, for January, um, we got down there um, right after the freeze, so there were still caterpillars out and adult butterflies, so the milky was um, pretty much not back, but, but we did get some, some good data. Um, so in, in this case, um, fly mortality dropped, um, so you can see here, uh, it dropped to um, about 28%. Um, and then our OE infection increased, and we only take out about just the ones that emerged as adults. Um, we had about 54% uh, that were infected with OE during that sampling period. Um, so what we'll be doing is we'll be, of course, adding in and uh, going back to the same sites um, this fall. Uh, so we'll have another round of collection. And of course, our fifth generation stuff is just now starting to wind down. Um, um, and so we'll have more of that to summarize as well. So that was all I had. Anybody have questions? So I'd like to do the fun part versus the thing that they can do. And we meaning, or I meaning David Wright. <laughs> but yes? What is the earliest things you usually see uh, pre, pre migrant uh, eggs and larvae in Texas? So I didn't know as much about Texas given that 2016 was our first year. I've always said for Oklahoma, when I've 
we in recent years have always said you know, August 15th is about when we start seeing eggs. However, it was about two weeks earlier this year. So I would um, so we did go down to Texas earlier this year, so we started in late August. Um, you know, to work around the timing of, of Hurricane Harvey, but um, uh, but so everything was earlier um, earlier this year. So, uh, but that's the early August in Texas. Uh, uh, well, like, you know, I did the monarch wish in the north central Oklahoma, and we had eggs. You know, it was ready to be in the August, right? And they, I mean, when that um, project came out, um, and so yeah, so a good bit early. So there were eggs in the works going out during the first cycle, so we had we didn't have you know, uh, data, so to speak, but. Yes. Um, so, if we go back to the So these are sites that all circled on here. So we've got the, the natural site um, that we've got spread out across each area. Um, we've got the great site site. They kind of have kind of an equal number of natural and earth type sites, and then the tropical and wealthy are kind of concentrated along the coast. Um, we've got a few new sites. I didn't add it to the new sites that we added um, this year, but that's kind of the distribution site. So we avoided East Texas because we have a group who are doing a lot of work in, in East Texas. And I know you guys kind of have scattered sites in terms of your more permanent locations. And so we're focusing on the fall and the fifth generation, so that's when almost all of our data are collected. But we did do the one round of spring surveys to get an idea of what we can see. And I would maybe like to do that again this spring, just to get, especially with um, you know, thinking about Hurricane Harvey and you know, could have changed some of the chronology and, and data areas. But, um, but yeah, so same even the, the fall focus. Well, thank you all very much for staying here.